Morning, church. Morning. It's a little better. I feel like we're about half asleep in here. We I might have to get y'all to stand up and run around a little bit, wake up. Uh, something about this time of year, I think that we all are feeling it. Uh, and we're, some of us are feeling the extra blessing of the heat, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> I thought to myself as I was driving to, to, to church this morning, I was awful cold, and I said, well, I got to worry. When I get to church, I'll get warm real fast. <laughs> this morning, I want to bring you all a message that I've titled, Thank God for Answered Prayer. And as Bonnie was stepping down the stairs here, she pointed at, at this book, this bu and said, you should tell him it's almost full, too. And, and as I've been reflecting this week about what I can bring to you all, what I can speak to you all of, I've had a number of different stories that have been floating in my mind, and this morning they kind of all came together. They kind of fit. And they fit because there is something different about the church than about people who aren't part of the church. Amen? And you, some of you are sitting there thinking, where's he going with this? Raise your hand if you have friends who are a religion other than, or, or friends or colleagues who are a religion other than Christianity. <coughs> Raise your hands if you have friends, family, you know, some connection to someone who is an atheist. For those of you who are able to raise your hands, if you know these people well, you know that there's a difference. And I don't just mean that they, they get to sleep in on Sundays and you don't. I mean that, that you can have a, a Muslim friend or a Jewish friend or a Hindu friend or even an atheist friend who is devout in their beliefs. For the Muslim, a devout Muslim truly believes with their entire heart that all of the problems of the world and all of the problems of their life will be solved if they can but submit to Allah enough. For the Hindu, the solution is that if they can but escape the cycle of reincarnation by obtaining enlightenment and doing so by living a good enough life in the caste that they are in, the gods will reward them by making them one with them. For the Jew, it's about not questioning God. If they can live faithfully the law of both Moses and their fathers, keep all of the traditions, and live a life that is good enough to standard, then in the end, God will tell them what their suffering was about. And for the atheist, if there is any question, if there is any problem, if there is anything they don't understand, they have the hope and belief that science will one day answer it. You noticed that in each of those in all of those paths, and, and you could name any other religion, tribal religions, Native American religions, religions that have popped up that are popular. You can even look at, at what I call the fake or faux Christian religions like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons where they take Jesus and they twist him into something else. And in all of those, there is a path to understanding. There is a path for the true believer who is devout to their faith that there is a solution. But in all of those, one thing is different. If you speak to a Muslim or you speak to a Jew or you speak to a Jehovah's Witness and you ask them about their prayer life, they all pray. But if you tell them or ask them if they ever hear back, the answer is no. My entire walk with Christ has been defined not so much by the theology that I've been taught, which is important. It's crucial to give our young people and new believers the foundation of the faith. Absolutely. But the thing that I have seen that is the greatest difference between those who believe in Jesus and those who don't is that Jesus answers prayer. And when I have spoken with Muslims or I have spoken with Jews or I have spoken with atheists, they can argue about theology, but they cannot argue about answered prayer. How can they explain when God comes through? And more than that, it makes them question, how come their belief system? How come Allah doesn't answer prayers when they cry out for healing? 
How come the Hindu gods, whichever one they particularly worship in their house, has never touched them and led them to a new job? How come they can't have in the synagogue a jar of testimonies? The biggest difference between those who serve Jesus and those who don't is answered prayer. I want you all to think about that next time you're speaking with your friend who's an atheist or your friend who's a Muslim or whatever other religion they follow. Think about what a life it must be to truly believe, to have great faith in your system and never once have had an answer to your prayers. But church, we don't have to worry about that, do we? We have a God who answers prayers, and thank God that he does. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles, or look on the screen. I've got a couple Old Testament stories and a few New Testament scriptures to reference. We're going to look at the book of 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, as we hear the story of a prophet of old for whom God answered prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we begin reading, actually, let me give you just a little background. So, in the land of Israel, there is a wicked king. You've heard me preach on him before. His name is Ahab. And he has an even wickeder wife. What was the queen's name? Jezebel. Some of y'all on this side know. Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel are known in the Bible as the worst royals to rule the nation of Israel. They were so wicked that not only did they introduce false gods, as many of them had, but Jezebel and Ahab actively worked to stamp out the name of Yahweh from the people. They wanted to make sure that no one who, who knew of God's name existed. Everyone had to worship Baal. Everyone had to worship Asherah. Because this was the king and the queen's decree. And in the midst of this, it got so bad that there were only about 350 prophets left in the land. And God removed them and hid them away. Because they, they feared for their life. Now you walk into this, there is a mighty man of God and his name is Elijah. He is known to be a prophet of God. Ahab at times has come to him when the land is in trouble. But it's finally time. Jezebel and Ahab have decided no more shall Elijah and these, these remnants, the people of God, survive. And so because of the great wickedness of the land of Israel, Elijah receives a word from God to pray for drought. Now, in the Old Testament, God had a special relationship with the people of Israel. If they kept their bargain, he kept his. And he spelled out in this contract that if they ever disobeyed and left him, he would remove his hand of blessing and instead send punishment to bring them back. So he had promised them prosperity in the land, but because now they were worshiping Baal and Asherah, he takes their prosperity away. Now some of you all may know some of the stories. There were miracles that happened. Elijah himself was fed by ravens sent by God's hand during this, this famine. During the drought for three and, and a half some years, um, the Lord sustained many people who were still faithful to him. Well, the story we have recorded is about a widow and her son who were preparing to eat their last meal and die. And the prophet came to them and God worked a miracle. This wasn't just a one-off case. This happened for the true believers who were stuck in this situation. God made provision. But what he didn't do is he didn't send rain. Why? Because it was his punishment. Now, it was important to know that because Baal and Asherah, the great gods of Ahab and Jezebel, promised that if you worshipped them and you prayed hard enough and you sacrificed correctly, that Baal and Asherah would answer your prayers and send rain. So for three and a half years, the 
the king and the queen and their priests and their prophets and the people who didn't know any better and, and went with the flow, they all sacrificed to these stone gods. They prayed to these stone gods. And in fact, there was a competition where Elijah stood on top of a mountain and the priests, 140 of them, cried out, cutting themselves because Baal said, if things get real bad, if you shed blood, I'll hear your prayer. Did Baal ever answer? No. Rain never came. Why? Because dead gods can't answer prayer. So here we have this great story. We have this great prophet who has, in one moment, through the, the act of prayer, he has caused drought and famine. And imagine that. We've been through drought here in our state. Not in the last couple of years, praise God. We got lots of water. But you, you think back five years where, where they kept showing that map and that orange and that brown and that yellow color and they would use at the, the meteorologist's desk kept getting darker and darker. More and more of the state was in trouble. But we still had rain. It's not like we went without rain. We just didn't have as much rain. But imagine if North Carolina went three and a half years without a drop of rain. A thousand plus days of nothing but hot sunshine. We'd be, we'd be in trouble. Every lake we have would be dried up. Every uh, well that we used to pump water from would be gone. The rivers would be, would be completely dry after three years. The crops would be all dead. Our forests would be dying. This is the land of Israel. Why? Because one prophet prayed. And he got the people's attention. Because the stone god whom they said controlled the weather could not answer prayer. Instead, at the end of those three and a half years, at the end of the trial, God then tells the same prophet, it's time to prove to them that I am a god who answers prayer. So let us hear the story of Elijah. Begin in verse 41. So this is after the great and, and uh, wonderful uh, contest between God and Baal where God has proved himself more powerful than stones. So Elijah says to Ahab, go up and eat and drink for there is, an, is the sound of abundance of rain. They haven't had a drop in three and a half years and here's this prophet telling him, that you're going to have a hurricane come through in a few minutes, so you better go get back to your house. So Ahab, he goes up to eat and he drinks. And Elijah went up to the Mount of Top Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and he put his face between his knees and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked and he said, there is nothing. So Elijah prays. We don't know what he says, but we assume it is, Oh Lord God, you promised this people rain. Send your rain. The servant goes and he looks, and there's nothing. He comes back, he reports it to Elijah. Does Elijah get disheartened? No. Why? Because he knows that God is a God who answers prayer. So then, seven more times he says, Go again. Imagine that tenacity in prayer. Seven times in a row, Elijah bows his face to the ground and he utters his prayer. Oh God, you are a God who answers prayer. Send rain upon this land. God doesn't answer. Oh God, you are a God who answers prayer. Send rain upon this land. Still no answer. Oh God, you are a God who answers prayer. Send rain upon this land. Seven times. Elijah bows his face to the ground, believing wholeheartedly each time he prays that the servant is going to come back and say, there's rain. So after seven times, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 44, so it came to pass on the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. 
So he said unto him, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Cloud so small that it can barely be seen. But that's enough. Ahab has utter and complete confidence in seeing and hearing of that one little report. A cloud, a speck in the distance that God has heard and answered. So he tells the servant and he tells Ahab, you better get moving because the storm is coming. Note verse 45. Now it happens in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind so that there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode all the way to Jezreel. And here's a miracle in this. Then the Lord came to Elijah, girded him up his loins, and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance. We're not concerned too much about verse 46. We're just talking about prayer and rain. But there's a miracle in there too, that someone runs faster than a horse. But think of this now. It's been dry for three and a half years. There's nothing green. There's nothing living in the entire land. And this prophet bows his head. And all it takes is the assurance that God answers prayer. We won't turn and read this one, but we will discuss it. Another story that sticks out in my, my mind from the Old Testament is the story of a woman named Hannah. Hannah had no children. And in that day, it was a great and terrible curse for a woman to have no children. And she loved her husband and she wanted desperately to have children. So every year they would go up to the, temp to the tabernacle to make their, their sacrifices and prayers. And Hannah prayed for a child. And Hannah's prayer was so deep and fervent that the prophet and the priest who was manning the tabernacle at the time thought that she was drunk and tried to kick her out of church. Have y'all ever seen someone so deep in prayer and deep in their misery that as they are crying out to God, you get a little concerned. You wonder to yourself, is this person okay? Sometimes prayer will take you there. Why? Because the depths of the human soul will take you as far as you'll let it go. Sometimes when we come to church, we bottle up our true feelings and our true grief, and we only let a little bit out because we're afraid. We're afraid for others to see who we are, but we're also afraid to let God see who we are. But not Hannah. Hannah laments and she cries and she screams in her prayer and she gives all of her anguish and all of her grief to God because she knows that the Lord is the only one who is merciful enough to solve her problem. And she takes a shot and she cries out and she says, God, open my womb that I may have a son. And if you give me this son, I pledge to you he will serve you all his days. She didn't even want the child for herself. She wanted the child to prove that God could hear and answer prayers. The next time we see Hannah is a year later and she is pregnant with child. Five years later, she does exactly what she promised God. She gives him to the Lord and that young boy becomes known as Samuel, the great prophet of the Old Testament. Whereas Eli looks at her and says, you're a drunk woman who doesn't belong in church. God looks at her heart and says, you, my child, are the very one who I desire to hear. He listens to her prayer. He listens to her lament. He listens to her fervently beg him for mercy. And he responds in kind. When Hannah left, not only did she have the one child who she left with God, but when her story ends, she has many more children and her heart rejoices saying, thank God for answered prayers. <coughs> we move and look in the New Testament into the book of James. And this will be on the screen here in just a moment. The Apostle James has some words for us as well. And actually, I'm going to back up a little, Don, if it's all right. I'm going to start in verse 13. James, in writing to the churches, encourages us 
to hear his words. Is there anyone, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is any one of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So James gives this encouragement to the church and some instructions that prayer is an important component of our daily life. Not only for ourselves, but as a community. We must pray for ourselves. We must pray for others. But together we pray for one another and build each other up. One of the most important parts of our service every Sunday is our prayer for the people. And, and sometimes it only takes a few moments. Sometimes our list, like this week and the last few, have been quite large. But it is a privilege and an honor to bear with one another the needs of the saints. Not, because, not just because it shows solidarity and unity, but because we have the honor and privilege of knowing that when we stand here, when Bonnie comes to the front and she calls out names and you call out names and together we pray for these people, we don't just do it as vain words, but our prayers are heard by God. The names that we have called out are lifted to the throne itself. And we have a God who hears and answers prayer. And sometimes we wonder why, if I have prayed for something, why hasn't it come to pass? There's a whole lesson in that. I can't get into all of it today. But what I can say is this. We have two examples from the Old Testament and one more from the New that says that sometimes our prayers need to be fervent. What does it mean to have fervent prayer? Fervent prayer is the kind of prayer that doesn't give up. Elijah knew without a shadow of a doubt God would send rain. And when God did not send rain the first time, did he get discouraged? No. He prayed again. And he kept going to God in prayer until rain came. And if God had waited and not sent the cloud on the seventh time, I think Elijah would have prayed an eighth or a ninth or a thirty-ninth. Fervent prayer is prayer that continues to knock upon heaven's door until. And how do I know that? Because James here says the fervent prayer and effect, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, verse 17. And here's the proof. Because Elijah was a man with our nature. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced fruit. James tells us that fervent prayer is Elijah prayer. Prayer of faith. Prayer that is tenacious. Prayer that won't give up. Hannah, she had no choice but God. And she prayed with so much force and so much power and so much emotion and so much realness that the people who were around her thought that she had cracked and lost her mind. But she didn't care because she wasn't praying to impress them. She was praying to reach the heart of God. In the New Testament, we have two more stories that I will share from Jesus himself. One of which is when he gives a parable and he says that we should, when we go to God in prayer, be like the woman who goes to an unrighteous judge who refuses to give her justice. She continues to go day and night, knocking upon his door, demanding justice until he gives in because he just wants her to go away. That's a hard story sometimes to interpret, but what Jesus is saying is that even if you are unsure of your, of your standing with God, pray. Even if you don't feel like you are justified, to come before the throne of God. Pray. Pray and pray and pray again until the answer comes. One woman in the New Testament did just that. She's simply known as the Syrophoenician. 
which means she wasn't a Jew. Jesus was traveling nearby her hometown. She heard about his coming. And she came to Jesus and she said, O oh Master, heal my daughter, for she is possessed. And the Lord Jesus looked at her and said, The dogs are not fit for the children's bread. That sounds like a harsh statement from our Lord Jesus, but what he was telling her is, I didn't come for the Gentile, I came for the Jew. And she looked back at Jesus and she said, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs. Now buried in her words were, you are merciful, just sprinkle a little. She refused, even though society told her she had no place to talk to a man even though she had no place to talk to a Jew, even when that rabbi told her, it is not my place to heal the Gentile child, she looked at him and said, I'm going to pray anyways. Heal my child because I'm not leaving without a blessing. All four of these stories, all four of these examples remind us of this that sometimes we have to knock more than once. You may have lifted up a prayer concern in your life. You may have given to God your concern and he didn't answer and you got discouraged. I want to encourage you, sometimes prayer is a marathon. God does answer prayers and praise God when those answers come immediate. Praise God when you can speak that prayer out and leave it and walk away and know that God is going to do it. But sometimes you have to press in. Sometimes the problem is just too big or the solution just too long suffering for you to give up. Don't give up. Press forward. You have a God who answers prayer. Turn with me to one last scripture. The book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul has some words of encouragement. This is Philippians chapter 4 verses 6. And seven. And speaking to his Philippian brothers, which if you'll remember the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the Philippians. They were the poorest church. They were the least educated church. They were the church who lived in the most sinful place with the least hope. And when they received the gospel, they rejoiced greatly because light had finally come into their darkness. But that doesn't mean that they as a people still didn't struggle. They had lots of needs. They had lots of problems, especially in comparison to their brothers and sisters who lived down in Corinth, who had all the money, all the wealth, all the power in the world. These Philippians, in comparison, had almost nothing. And Paul writes to them to encourage them about the great power of prayer. He says to them, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all of your understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul reminds the Philippians that we serve a God who answers prayer. Now, does that mean that the Philippians could have asked for anything? No. Just as you and I can't ask for everything and expect God to answer. He's not a magic genie. He's our God. He's our master whom we serve. He's our father. And there are good things that he desires for us to have and there are bad things he desires for us not to have. So you can't ask for something that would cause you to sin. And I want to be clear because I've known people who've gotten mad and frustrated when they had a, a wish list like they were given to Santa Claus and they gave it to Jesus instead and he didn't answer. No is an answer. You can't go to, act to God and ask like he's an ATM. That doesn't mean he's not concerned about your needs. He promises us here in this book of Philippians he's, a, he's concerned about our needs. But getting perspective about what our needs versus what our desires are is the key. But take it to God. Pray to God. And God will answer. And sometimes he will answer by telling you no and teaching you how to grow in faith. Other times the answer will be yes. But regardless of how the answer comes or what the answer is, we can thank God 
that he answers prayer. Consider again your friends, your family, your co-workers, who they worship something other than Jesus. What hope do they have? Maybe one day science will come with a, a cure for a disease that we currently can't cure. Maybe if we can just submit hard enough, Allah will have mercy and make things right. Perhaps when I knock on three more doors and try and convert them to my religion, God will then remember my need. The unique thing about the Christian church that no other religion, no other people can say is that we serve a God who answers prayer. And church, our response should be, thank God that he does. Today we're going to sing and meditate, I guess, during our invitational on with the song, Give Thanks. I would like to encourage each of you to do that very thing. In fact, we're just going to have instrumental. We're not going to sing words. While Donovan is playing this song, I want you to think back over this last year about the things you can give thanks for. The things where God has answered your prayer. Say thank you, God, for answering that prayer. And in the same token, if there are things left to pray for, if there are things that you need to press in, take a few moments while this song pray, plays and pray for them. But then like, like Paul reminds us, while you're praying, give thanks. Give thanks for the things he did. Give thanks for the things you know he can and will do. Give thanks for what he's done and pray for what's left.